Hello, everybody, and welcome to the University of Melbourne's Mid-Afternoon Masterclass as part of Science Festival. Um, it's great to see you all. We've already cracked 50 people coming in, and I'm sure there's more coming in as well. Um, this is the third Masterclass uh, for the week. Um, uh, we're going to be here on Thursday and Friday as well at two o'clock and all the events uh, are here so we can hear from uh, University of Melbourne scientists um, and chat to them about their incredible work. Today it is hot dogs, triangles and AI pattern finding in machine learning. So I'm super excited about it. Um, Matt's on screen already, but I will just go through a few things before we uh, formally start, Matt. Um, for starters, I'll just acknowledge country, first of all. Uh, myself, Matt, and the, uh, the whole team bringing you this event um, uh, are here on Parkville, and it's the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. Um, just want to acknowledge uh, uh, Elvis past, present, and emerging, and just uh, acknowledge they've been caring for this land for over 60,000 years, um, and we're very blessed for that. Um, and really, this week of all weeks, it's so important to remember that they are our first scientists. Uh, so thank you again for joining us. Um, we are obviously on Zoom, um, so uh, we are sort of separated a little bit by a screen, but we really want today to be as interactive as possible. So please um, uh, leave as many uh, comments and questions in the chat as possible. Uh, one thing I do want to mention, so uh, it, it, there's, uh, um, if you don't know Zoom so well, um, in the top right hand corner, you can change the view from either gallery view or speaker view. It's up to you what you'd like to do, but uh, gallery view will uh, allow you to sort of focus on um, sort of the presenter and, and the um, presentation as well. So um, that's probably what we'd recommend. So that's the top right hand corner. It says view, which is click on that um, and you can go to presenter view. Um, uh, also, so as I said, we'd love as much interaction as possible. On the bottom screen, we've got the chat function open. Um, so please click on that um, and add any comments you've got, um, any questions you might have all throughout the presentation, and we'll get to them at the end. Uh, just so we can have a bit of a practice of using the chat, just to get everyone a little bit warmed up, um, please could you let us know where you're Zooming in from? Um, so open up the chat, let us know um, which suburb, which state, which country, maybe you're from a school, um, let us know. Oh, we've got India already, that's good, Melbourne, New Zealand, University of Melbourne, great, um, here on campus, no doubt, Clayton, a few from India, lots from Melbourne, China as well, awesome. South Australia, Hong Kong. Oh, this is amazing. That's so great. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, keep them coming, but it's amazing to have you all here. So thank you. Um, so while more of them come in, I will now finally introduce Matt, who's been on your screen. Um, I've got a little bio, Matt, and then we can um, pass on to you. So uh, Matthew Mack, I am calling him Matt because um, first name basis, but Matthew Mack officially is a teaching associate in the School of Mathematics and Statistics here at the University of Melbourne, where he enjoys teaching a breadth of subjects spanning the discrete mathematics and operations research specialization. He is occasionally, uh, he also occasionally contributes to authoring and proofreading high school maths textbooks and related resources. So who knows if you're from a school out there, you might be uh, uh, using a text that Matt has actually uh, proofread. Um, when he isn't falling down uh, various rabbit holes on the internet, uh, Matthew also enjoys learning Japanese, doing cross-stitch and playing the cello amongst many other secret long-term projects yet to reach fruition. I love it. Welcome finally, Matt. Thank you so much um, for being here. How are you today? All right. Uh, and first things first, we'll make sure the technology is working and that I can share in the correct screen because on my end, I've got three monitors and uh, here we go. So Julie, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Of course, Um, yes. So as a teaching associate, I'm like most of the time, I most of the work I do is teaching, but also helping um coordinate a few things behind the scenes and mentoring some of the new teachers. And I'm, I'm also aware I've got a bit of a positive reputation, which... um. It's, well, to most people, that's probably a good thing, but I do digress. Let's get on with the talk. So, <laughs> so okay, so we're just going to jump straight into an activity from the first go, and I, I want to see um want to see some responses in the chat, and uh, where I want to ask you to complete the following poem. Mathematics is blank. And while we, while we get some responses in the chat, I'll pass the, I'll pass the question to Julie. If mathematics is an animal or an object, what would it be and why? Um, okay, so 
I think maths would be well I think there's a lot of objects maths would be just something but oh like a Rubik's cube like everything all oh, yes. fits together all nice oh um, that, I love that or like a, you know like all moving parts all working together well Ah, I like that idea. And actually, there is um, a branch of discrete mathematics that actually um, analyzes the Rubik's cubes and the patterns, which uh, kind of gives you an idea of the different types of symmetry. So that's a, um, so if you study at University of Melbourne, you actually you, you actually get to get a nice look at that. So if you know a bit of group theory, then uh, you will be able to understand what the symmetries of the Rubik's cube. So that's that's actually a lovely answer. Thank you, Julia. Um, we've got a few uh, responses to the chat. A universal language, the language of science. Uni um, frustrating, completely understandable. Beautiful as well. We've got about got people saying it's patterns and fun. Oh, uh, 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 well, uh, it's it's a bit of a mixture for me, but I think um, I like to say mathematics to me is like that friend that you occasionally get annoyed at, but you still like to hang out with. Um, so we, but. <laughs> This is a lovely variety of responses. So thank you. So um, so hopefully all of you have got the chat open just to kind of see what everyone else has, because one thing that's really important here is to see the variety of responses and we'll, as to why we'll get, we'll get back to that soon enough. So when we're talking about machine learning and AI models and or tools, whichever way you want to talk about it, the, the frame, the frame of thinking that I want you to kind of think about it for now is that there are kind of two main components. The first part is the data, which is primarily composed of human input and feedback where, uh, where like say in chat GPT, you can actually tell it to follow certain instructions. And as for, for those who do know or don't know, then uh, this kind of data is used to train or tune parameters of the model. And sometimes some models and maybe some of the more earlier ones that you end up learning in high school and early and um, undergraduate, you, and at the undergraduate university level that may not appear to use data, but um, but sometimes there are theoretical assumptions of which, you know, some of these specific numbers come from. So that's kind of the core data part. And, um, and then of course the other part is the model itself, where as you can imagine, this is all the mathematical equations and the algorithms and, um, and just to kind of give you some keywords to sort of just help further your understanding and awareness that, they usually include some randomness. So the fancy word that we use for randomness is stochastic. So if you see something that's got the word stochastic in it or the word Mar or the name Markov in it, ch chances are the model will include some kind of randomness. And we won't go into details of the randomness, but um, I think it's kind of, you can kind of think it as simple as flipping a coin or rolling the dice. So Within this framework or within this kind of basically idea, if we try to think of all your submissions to the chat as all of your data, and then we can ask some basic questions in terms of uh, what could the model be? So, um, okay, so I am just going to turn on the annotator and kind of just give you a basic idea of what some of these fancy names are. So the discrete uniform distribution is essentially that if I was to take Every so I'll start writing so maths hmm. is and then say uh let's say okay we'll take one beautiful and then patterns and then frustrating and hard so and that's just obviously there's many much more, but of course I, I can only write so much. So when we talk about a discrete uniform distribution, we are just basically saying that, okay, out of all the options, each of them has a equal probability of occurring. So in this case, there are four options and, in an, and basically it's just saying our model, the discrete uniform distribution is just going to randomly pick each, each one of these a 25% probability. So that's uh so the discrete uniform, so that's the discrete uniform distribution. So we're gonna move on to and so something a little bit harder is the, the Markov chain, which as you probably guess contains some some kind of probability, but the um the way that it's gonna be a little bit different. So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna write down some of the the longer um just gonna write down the oh okay the language of science. That's an excellent answer. Of course, there are some philosoph uh, philosophical implications that um, that uh, I won't go into, but there I do I, I actually did anticipate um, some interesting 
uh, and then a tool of understanding that is an excellent answer to of understanding. Hmm. Okay. So the idea of a Markov chain, very loosely speaking, is that when we, when we start with the brief, we think, okay, well, each of each, and we're going to just think only of the next word. Now, the idea is that each of these individual words has an individual probability, but not necessarily the same probability. So we could say, okay, well, that's is beautiful. Let's say that's got a half chance of occurring. And then we could say, I put uh, that each, that um, the next word being language has got a one on six chance of happening. One on six is for frustrating, one on six for the word tool. And then what can, what can for a Markov chain specifically, we can, as a very simple idea, we can move on to the next word. So we see language of science, but language in itself, uh, we could say, okay, well, the next word off is going to have a, some kind of probability occurring. And let's say if there were other other um, submissions that said language of something else, then it could there could be additional words there. And the idea is that it, for every single, for every individual word, and for every individual word after that, there is a not necessarily equal probability of those happening. Similar similar for tool of understanding, um, you could say okay, well the word tool is going to branch out into other words as well, where there's going to be different probabilities occurring. So, um, so that's to kind of give you a basic idea of a Markov chain where uh, there's kind of two different representations of it that you tend to see depending on how you study it. In mathematics, we usually write it as a matrix of values, um, but I, um, I believe in engineering or perhaps other disciplines, you might kind of see more like a flow chart or a state space chart for those of you familiar with the terms. But again, I digress. It's a very bad habit of mine. Moving on to large language models. Very loosely speaking, there I don't have a simple way to explain it, but you can think of it as a much more advanced Markov chain with additional structures that are, is able to capture more nuances of the English language. For example, sentence structure, uh, the difference between nouns, verbs, adjectives, adverbs, and an idea of how or how all these sentences are put together. Now, to to address the bottom, to address the bottom line. If say I use a discrete uniform distribution and I sit and it get and your AI model gave out an answer that said mathematics is frustrating, would you necessarily agree with that? And this is where I sort of want to touch on the the bit in the the blurb where we can talk about well, would it necessarily be a correct answer in your opinion, or would it be an opinion? And that's sort of the things we are going to explore in this talk. So to kind of bring it back to like actual, um, like some some actual mathematical theory that uh, you might you might have seen in primary or high school, we've got the idea of a line of best fit, and or at the undergraduate level we tend to call it linear regression for the statisticians out there. And we and again we have the same idea. We have a data. We have a bunch of data, which is scatter plot, and uh, we have a specific model where it's specifically the line of best fit. And the S, and hopefully you um for those of you who remember your linear models, the the most basic one in two dimensions is y equals mx plus c. But here's the question: Is the line itself a sufficient representation of the data? And that's kind of the that's kind of the question I sort of just want to prime you with, uh, because in the in reality, data is often pretty messy, has a lot of variation. And what and sort of the question I want to pose here is: Is the line of best fit necessarily the best model that can say represent the data? And you you might be thinking in the back of your head, no, not really. So now the question then becomes: Well, okay, what do we do to try and capture some of that variance? So. In the previous slide, I showed that I showed a red line across the data that's kind of like an average of um average of the data. Statisticians will recognize that um the line of best fit is a result of minimizing the mean square root error. And but let's say, for example, that if given the randomness of the data, what happens if we consider other lines of so-called not necessarily best, but just as viable with a certain probability? So that's where I've joined some additional lines in green to kind of try and illustrate my point. Now, of course, just as a nod to my fellow mathematicians out there, 
Uh, you can argue that the li that in this case, a linear line is not necessarily the best way to represent the data. And and so hopefully you can understand that I'm doing purposely doing this for illustration purposes. Right. So with that in mind, we're going to move into the next section, which I'm going to, and I'm um, just going to try and, uh, oh, that's a good question. Couldn't we use regularization to decrease bias and variance? Absolutely. Yes. So again, the presentation I'm doing here is kind of much more simplified. Um, assuming that that well, we have to consider that there are people who might not know what regular regularization is. So, um, yeah. So yeah, you're definitely one of the more knowledgeable ones. So, <laughs> um, but hopefully, hopefully, as we move on, you will sort of be able to understand the point I'm getting at. So, okay. So moving on. So we've got a bit of a callback. Um, so if any of you recognize these kind of um little quizzes that pop up when you, you try to submit a form or any kind of official documentation or something that asks you to verify, um. Verify basically that you are not a robot. So these are called, well, the, the primary version is called the Google Recapture. And you may you may remember this as in terms of trying to identify what kind of objects there are in an image. And um in a nutshell, the in in a nutshell, what this was initially designed for was that to actually help Google's AI models to train, uh, to help them train in terms of image recognition. So whenever you were uh Whenever you were answering one of these captures, you were being a single piece of human data that was helping train Google's AI for that kind of information. Thankfully, or perhaps not so thankfully, captures are a bit different now. I, I suspect most of you will mostly just have to tick a box, but uh, which goodness knows what could be happening behind the scenes, but let's not entertain that for the time being. So we're going to do a similar activity with one of the most important questions ever to grace the internet. Is a hot dog a sandwich? So, um, so at least depending on how long you've been around on the internet, um, you probably have noticed a fair amount of so-called debate. Um, and uh, if you're thinking, well, hot dog is probably not a sandwich, that's fine. That's uh, that's a completely acceptable answer. What I'm more interested in is why is a hot dog a sandwich, or why is a hot dog not a sandwich? So. We're going to move on to the, we're going to kind of extend this task a little bit further. And we've got the second task for you where hopefully you've had a lovely lunch because yeah, some of this food looks quite delicious. Uh, it doesn't help that. Um, well, I should, probably shouldn't be advertising KFC, but I was actually quite surprised that they have a variant of the double down on offer at the moment. <laughs> um, so um, so have a think about it, pop it in the chat. Uh, I want you to pick maybe one or several food items. I want you to tell me if it is, if why it's not a sandwich. So it can be something like if, uh, an ice cream taco is not a sandwich. And I want you to be, I want you to let me know in the chat, what makes it different from your idea of a sandwich? What features are you looking at that makes it different from a sandwich? So Julia, uh, which, which food looks the most delicious to you that is not a sandwich um okay so um it's a very important question so i think um well fairy bread for starters i don't it does definitely is not a sandwich i think mm -hmm. because it doesn't have a top and a bottom yep it, i don't know does that make sense um yeah, also, absolutely I taco because if it's got a taco it's like one thing like it's sort of you know it's hugging the food but it's not like on top and bottom you know Mm -hmm. so um that's is that a good reason i don't know yeah no absolutely we can work with the top and bottom idea so yeah, um you, uh, we, we, uh so when you say top and bottom i guess you're kind of thinking well it ha there has to be two separate um layers. pieces and slices of bread right yes yes layers i want layers layers oh layers okay so in and so and i do apologize i'm gonna borrow into that definition a little further so when you say layers do the layers necessarily have to be bread oh. No. Uh no. Oh. I didn't, I didn't know this, but I realize now that maybe the KFC double down maybe that's a sandwich. I see that's a sandwich. Mm -hmm. So so that so just to be clear that uh would you see the KFC double down as a sandwich? Yes. Okay. And then uh, Is that maybe, controversial? I don't know. I I wouldn't. But well, I've done all the thinking, so this is kind of more just to get your opinion now into okay. the um into the open as well yeah, as with yeah, the yeah, yeah. Yeah, with the audience. Right. So we've got and we've got some we've got someone saying KFC double down is not a sandwich because there's no bread. So 
Um, so to the person who says that opinion, um, so we can see that um, they're, they're thinking of what a sandwich is, that is that the two layers have to involve bread. So we've got a bit of disagreement here. Again, this is all in good fun. <laughs> and uh, we, we definitely have a few other comments saying that sandwiches need bread, which is completely understandable. So Julia, I'm going to come back to you. I'm going to ask you, is a vanilla slice a sandwich? Because arguably we could say, well, it's um it's got two layers of pastry and uh, custard filling in between. Hmm. Um, look, it's close, but I, I would say no. No? Okay. Um, what makes and the it different? reason, yeah, well, because I think the top's got a different type of layer. Uh, like the, the top and the bottom aren't the same. Ah, okay. So is that something we shouldn't necessarily extend to all sandwiches in that the top and bottom have to be the same, the, the same uh, item or structure? We're not looking for a serious answer. We could just go with um what, what answer first comes to mind. <laughs> uh, I've got someone saying vanilla slice is not a sandwich because it's baked as a whole. Okay, so that could that gives us some comment of um in terms of how it's prepared, whereas uh, we could think about a sandwich as uh combining bread with different ingredients inside. Um lasagna and vanilla slice, no bread. Yep. Sorry, Julia, were you gonna say something? Oh no! I heard something over the um. Oh, uh, so Julia, I'm did just, you? I'm just uh, uh, agreeing. Okay, yeah. Souvlaki is not a sandwich because it's wrapped around, not the top and bottom. Yeah, that that. Uh, so yeah, so I assume you would say the same for a hot dog and a sausage sizzle, as well as an ice cream taco. Um, what happens? Would it be a sandwich if I accidentally cut the wrap in half? So now that it's two separate pieces of bread. So would you now call that a sandwich? So the the person who says souvlaki is not a sandwich don't necessarily need to respond, but I'm I'm just I'm throwing out ideas here. So um let's have a look. Okay, so we've got number eight. So number eight, the vanilla slice is not a set is it not a sandwich because it's sweet? Okay. Hmm, that raises an interesting question because I believe in the US they have something that's called an ice cream sandwich by the name doesn't mean you have to say it is a sandwich um and then for number six he has no lid okay so lid you can think about top and bottom so um oh oh that's an interesting one i feel like i could call a hot dog a sandwich if the sausage was sliced up and the bread halves weren't connected yeah so we're making a d distinction between um we're making a dis distinction between having a single continuous piece of bread and all, oh, and uh, sorry, let me finish that. We're making the distinction between having a single continuous piece of bread versus having two separate pieces of bread. And uh, oh, we've got a counter example to the it's sweet and not tell a sandwich is a sandwich and it's sweet. So to the person who said that vanilla slice is not a sandwich because it's sweet, do we have a disagreement of opinion here? Or would you be open to changing your mind? I wonder. So, okay, we could entertain this forever, but I think, um, <laughs> uh, but I, I think I will move on to the um, s some of the points that I want to make. So, unfortunately, this is uh, a very fun activity. So, thank you all for participating. Um, I'm seeing lots of reactions. So, thank you to everyone in in the chat for participating with each other. I do apologize if I haven't read out your um your submission, but it's still nonetheless um, very enlightening to see so many different opinions. So I think we sort of know the answer to the first point I want to make here. Do we all agree on the definition of the sandwich? But now the key question coming back to AI is how should this be reflected in an AI model? And similarly, if like say we trained an AI model on all, all, all this data that we've had in the chat and we asked an AI is through item a sandwich, what would be a sufficient answer. So when we think about, like when we think about how people type questions into Google, like, or when they ask ChatGPT a question, how do they phrase the question and what kind of answer do they get? So if I, uh, if I say, okay, well, this, uh, this is a, do you want a yes or no answer or do you want a percentage or do you want a nuanced explanation, which this one I rate myself. So um, so as you can imagine, I've kind of just been true. I've, I've thought about it for too long, I will admit. So um, 
So we're kind of running out of time, so we won't do the activity, but I'll kind of mention the idea here. And uh, what I wanted to do was basically to say, okay, well, describe a triangle using only words. And similarly, what, what's expected to happen is that we're all going to have um, like different ways of explaining what a triangle is, but in a very similar way, we can um, we can be reasonably confused. Um, but yeah, if, if you like, you, you can um, leave your impressions in the chat, but uh, given our time constraints, um, given our time constraints, um, we, we might, I might be rushing through a bit. So, um, so usually, uh, the importance, well, the, and the difference here now is that we're dealing with a mathematical object as opposed to something that's a bit more vague with, um, that's something that's a bit more vague. Okay. We've, we've got a, Okay. X, oh, some some lovely submissions come in. Uh, with uh, with three vertices and axes, each at different angles, a shape with three sides, three lines all connected at the corners. Okay. okay so now I'm going to be really mean <laughs> and point out um because what I was going to do I was going to draw but um okay so so just to this one three lines all connected at the corners. But lines don't have corners, so I'm not sure what you are referring to as corners. Um, enclosed space by means of three straight lines. Okay, what does it? What is a space, and what does it mean to be enclosed? Uh, let's have a look at some of the other submissions. Um, a, a three-sided polygon. What is a polygon? Um, three sides. Uh, three-sided geometrical shape whose the ang angles add up to one eighty in two D. Um, so what is a geometrical shape? What is angle? So. Um, so the, the, I'm hoping you're sort of seeing a pattern in the way I'm thinking, and that's kind of that's kind of what I want to try and get across. So we'll, so I kind of want to ask, what's an unambiguous definition of a triangle? And now they, um, and I kind of just want to show you kind of a way of thinking of deconstructing a definition. So if we, and as you know, they say don't quote Wikipedia. So here I'm not taking Wikipedia's. Uh, definition as fact, we're going to try and I'm going to try and show you how I think about it. So from Wikipedia, it says a triangle, <laughs> someone just wrote in the chat, a triangle is a pizza slice, unless it's a frozen square pizza. Excellent responses. <laughs> okay. So from Wikipedia, it says a triangle is a polygon with three edges and three vertices. And so as you can kind of see in a very similar way, um, I'm asking what is a polygon? What is an edge? What is a vertex? And you'll see that I'm highlighted the nouns, and in some cases there'll be some adjectives as well. And but in when we're talking about these mathematical differences, we can unroll them and we can try to understand them by looking at the definition of each of these individual words. So if we were to do the same thing, <laughs> sorry, the, the the chat is giving me um a few chuckles. So um you all are very excellent people. So so similarly, and um, if you've been on those Wikipedia binges where you're kind of just clicking links through, then you will probably be familiar with um, kind of this way of thinking. So from the previous slide, we're just going to look at the first word, what is a polygon? And in this case, again, we go through Wikipedia, a triangle, a polygon is a plain figure made up of line statements connected to form a closed polygonal chain. And then again, this brings up more questions. And you might think I've been silly, but the reality is that um, the reality is that a lot of um, our the, our human brains tend to um, tend to subsume this kind of definitions and make shortcuts. So in general, uh, describing something accurately in text is difficult because there are a lot of dimensions we can think of, but also because um, we tend to assume that others understand the context and similar definitions of um, to to have a to have a similar mutual understanding. And we can extend this idea to not just triangles, but as demonstrated earlier, sandwiches, or you can think about, um, or you can think about like if you were trying to describe an image to someone else, how would you try to describe an image to someone such that they can sufficiently replicate it? And so this makes the makes a certain philosoph philosophical question: Is there perhaps a limitation of the human language in its capacity to describe certain aspects of the human experience? Um, so for those of you kind of just thinking, no. I would like you to try and think about what the what 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 kind of experience experiences that might be that would be difficult to communicate to a computer. So 
just to round things off, my current opinions on uh, my current opinions and perspectives, not necessarily correct, uh, but how does, how does AI currently handle ambiguity? Where here, what we can do is that, uh, as indicated by the triangle task, we can add some additional context. And then, um, and this is why um, theoret theoretical models exist. And in fact, actually, one of my past students is now doing a PhD in applying moral frameworks or frameworks of morality into AI because they they want to try and investigate the question of whether can AI can make moral decisions. And but of course, the more complicated the model is, the more computational power there is. And of course, as I mentioned at the start, there is a degree of randomization, but the, the nurture of randomization means that there is definitely a random chance that our AI models might not necessarily get things correct because it has no does not necessarily have the human intuition that allows it to choose the right kind of context. So that wraps up my talk. So thank you for listening. And if you want to be an orchestrator of chaos in your next group discussion, here is some additional type of types of questions to get people talking. Um and before I wrap this up, I would like to add, there will be an extended versions of the slides where I've sort of written down some additional notes. So if you're a teacher, you want to kind of adapt some of these activities for the classroom, or if you're someone who wants to kind of read about how I, how I designed these activities or uh, mathematical considerations that I purposely have left out, it's all in the extended, it's already in the extended versions of the slides where I've written, the, I've written down a bunch of notes. So with that, thank you for listening. May your um, next food discussion be fruitful. <laughs> thank you so much, Matt. That was fascinating. Amazing way to end it off. I love it. Um, so many, so many interesting things and um, just so engaging too. And thank you to everyone out there, um, quote unquote, all the one, all the, I think, excellent people. Um, in the audience for uh, contributing all those fantastic answers. I loved it. The tools of understanding, that was really good. Um, and I, I I never knew I had so many opinions about whether something was a sandwich or not. Who knew? Mm. It's fascinating. Um, all right. So uh, just to call out to everyone, there's there was a lot in that um, uh, presentation, but a lot more about AI that you might be interested in. So please put uh, all your questions in the chat and we'll get to them. Um, uh, yes, all as uh, as soon as possible. Um, so, um, so I mean, I'll, I'll start off with AI then, Matt. What did you do? You use chat GPT and what are your thoughts on how it's being used right now? Um, I actually don't use ChatGPT mostly because the use cases I can think of, um, I already have the skills to do it myself. So there's uh, kind of no particular reason for me to outsource that kind of um knowledge, but that's not to say I haven't been paying attention to how other people have been using it. Um, for example, one of the um for mathematicians to know Terry Tao, who's actually been um documenting how he's been using chat GPT for certain tasks. And there's kind of this I mean, certain things where it. he's been touching on that essentially requires a lot of effort uh, and a high level of skill, but it's still kind of a lot of, but so it still requires a lot of manual effort. Um, hmm. So there, there is a use for chat GPT for academics in the sense of making it easy to do certain tasks in, in a nutshell. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, and just a reminder to everyone in the audience as well, please, please remain on uh, mute just so we can hear all of Matt's answers. Um, we don't have much long uh, longer to go in the presentation. Um, but thank you. That, that's fantastic. Um, uh, I'd also love to know, I mean, th there are so many fascinating parts in this field um, within mathematics and and why is it that this particular field piques your interest the most? What 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 is it about this that you love? I, I think for me, it's... Um... Well, when I first, um, well, one of the reasons people enjoy mathematics to begin with is that it has, it's, that, it's because there's usually one correct answer. But as I grew older, then I realized, okay, well, we have strictly defined rules. But then what became more interesting to me was that for things in life, which do not have clearly defi defined boundaries or those kind of rules, like what would be a sufficient way to model them and mm. to have an, have a reasonably accurate represent, representation because the reality is that the math mathematical models we use cannot necessarily emulate real world examples, but often we find that they are good enough to give us some of an estimate. So there's always the persistent question of how can we make these models better? And 
on the mathematical level, like how can we ensure these models are so-called good enough? Mm, yeah, look, it's a fascinating field. I think I was definitely like that in school when I just, I liked doing my maths questions because I had a right answer or a wrong answer. Mm. But I know things get a little bit more complicated than that when you start to study at the university level. Yeah. Um, okay, so we have a question. Um, what are your thoughts on using network science as a tool for um, stimulating a more human-like ML model? I'm not sure what ML model is, but... Uh, uh, ML, it would be machine learning. Um, I'm machine learning. I'm machine learning. <laughs> yes. Um, I don't have to... Um, I mean, in, in some sense, network science already exists and is used. So, but um, I think there's pro you're probably thinking... How do I clarify this? I think what you're what you're thinking of in terms of network science, I might be thinking of in terms of graph theory specifically, but I think it's they are definitely already used in machine learning models, but it's really a question of which machine le learning model you're looking at. So um Yeah, okay. All right. So yeah, it's probably already being used. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Awesome. Uh, another question. Thank you so much. Keep the questions coming, everyone. Um, so next one, Matt, where can we learn oh, Where can we learn more about this uh, for people that have only done half a unit of methods? Okay. So people want to know more. How do we find out more? Apart oh, from, gosh. we will be sending to everyone, but um, yeah, where, where else can they find out more, Matt? I, I wish I had an answer for you. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think... Because part, part of the reason that this kind of thing is really hard to communicate is because um, like uh, mathematicians by nature, we like our exact definitions. So, mm -hmm. what, but when I, when I wrote this talk, I realized, okay, I actually have to compromise these exact definitions and attention to detail in order to make the information more accessible to a more general audience. So, um, and part of the problem with using analogies is that um, some people can take the analogies too far or maybe fixate too much on the analogy, at least from a pedagogy perspective. So mathemat mathematicians are usually quite careful in like making these kind of analogies. So um, that's not to say that there are definitely attempts at, uh, by people out there, but um, I've been, I'm, I, I can quite comfortably say I've been living under a rock with respect to knowing uh, reasonably accessible resources. So my mm -hmm. humble apologies. <laughs> well, look, I'm not sure where this, um, uh, with this person's in school or university, but um, I'd say continuing to study maths in school and being able to study at university and potentially coming to one of Matt's classes classes would be a great place to start I think to find out more about all this area um awesome uh okay so um okay so in the chat it looks like there's a couple of people have asked this which is great so thank you so how can we limit misinformation as a result of um LLMs la uh, large language model thank you for in brackets yeah that's that's um that's a tricky question um a bit outside my area of expertise unfortunately um I think I, um but as someone who does pay a lot of attention, attention to the internet and Twitter or X, if you'll call it that now, um, <laughs> um, I think the there is going to be a moving away from something that is publicly available or at least sort of, um, how, how do I put it? One thing I already see happening is that um, sort of um, closer communities are sort of branching off and creating their own separate communities where there is at least a level of... Um, like um accountability that's it in terms of information being shared so um so what i what i suspect at the moment is that there'll be a moving away from platforms very open platforms like tiktok twitter slash x um where people can kind of just post freely without any kind of um without any kind of consequence to platforms which might be a bit built more on trust or you know, maybe academics might have their own website where at least they might have the, their own expertise. But yeah, there will definitely be some kind of shifting of the media landscape to uh, new sources that uh, have a certain level of transparency and accountability. Mm -hmm. Yeah, X for scientists. I'm all for that. Mm. Let's let's get that started. Good idea, Matt. Great. Um, all right. Another question for from Alexa, thank you so much. So, um, any tips for making maths less scary for kids and adults? It's a very um, good point. I know maths can be a bit, might find it a bit a bit difficult. So, what would you say? Oh, um, it's hmm. Um, for me personally, um, 
for me personally, um, like when I teach maths, I the the people who come to me, they, they come to me because they have an intrinsic interest. So the interest for me, the interest has to come from within. And so mm. what I do when I teach, I try to find like what are they curious about, what ideas do they have, um, what ideas do they have, and um try to build upon that because essentially um mathematics is a discipline that kind of builds a lot on past knowledge. So in a similar vein, when I teach, um, I, I have to try and find something that they know of or already have a mental model of in their head and then build upon that. So in terms of making it less scary, um, especially for a general audience, um, the general idea is to try and um, start on a topic that hopefully everyone can relate with. So um, for instance, uh, since, I, since uh, at least in the briefing for this talk, I know that um, people should at least have a high school understanding of maths. That's where I bring up the the line of best fit and linear regression because hopefully it's something that everyone has seen. And then uh, in the second example, when I chose the food idea, is something a sandwich. We all know what a hot dog is. We all know what a sandwich is. So it's an appropriate springboard for me to be able to build on the ideas that I want to be able to de to to demonstrate. So, um, but for a like like say for a TV show, um. For a TV show or a much more general audience, this is obviously much harder and not everybody will have, not everybody will necessarily be on the same correct ground. So this is this is one of those things where um, at least the good communicators and good educators like Eddie Wu, they are able to adjust depending on the situation. Mm. Yeah, amazing. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, understanding your audience and, and adapting it and making it relatable, that, that's that's incredible. And you've, and you've done an amazing job of it today. It was a fascinating talk. So mm -hmm. um, I'm sure anyone out there that might have been um on the fence about maths, I'm sure they're um very dedicated to it now. So that's awesome. All right, so we don't have like much um long yet uh, left. I've got two questions, two last questions for you though, Matt. So mm -hmm. what um what are you working on right now in your research, um, um or, or in this area? And then I'll I'll leave my other question after that. Um, I I don't I don't have so much personal research specifically. Um, well, at least for personal interest, it's more in terms of tertiary tertiary mass education. But that's not to say I'm not paying attention to what's happening at least in my area of optimization because that was because essentially that's my specialty. I'm still in touch with the academics and I still turn up to certain talks. So, um, yeah, one of the big things happening in within the University of Melbourne in terms of research is that. It's like we've got this machine, we've got these machine learning models, we've got these AI models, and we've got algorithms to solve them. But as it turns out, different algorithms are better for different specific scenarios. So what's happening in um in our big uh, in one of the centers called Optima is that um they're actually doing research called instant space analysis, where the idea is that we're gonna test a whole bunch of these algorithms on one specific problem, but change all the different parameters to see which set of parameters is good for this algorithm, which set of parameters is good for that algorithm and so on. So mm -hmm. it's kind of a very meta analysis of what's happening in AI right now. Yeah, great, great. And a little insight into the work of a mathematician. I love it. Um, okay, final question. This is very, very important. And it affects everyone in Australia. <laughs> what is the mathematical probability of the Matildas winning tonight at eight o'clock? It's really important that we know this. Oh goodness. Um I oh goodness the pressure. Um well can we can we all hope that it's a hundred percent? Good answer. <laughs> yeah, okay, amazing, amazing. All right. Uh well we'll I'm happy to leave it there. I'm happy to leave it there at the end of the question. Um all right, so uh, uh thank you so much, um uh Matthew. That was uh and Really fascinating talk. Really loved it. A nice little insight um, into mathematics and hot dogs and sandwiches and definitions and all the things. So appreciate you taking your time um, to present. So thank you so much. Um, and thank you to our audience as well. Um, lots of engagement, lots of comments and everything. And it really made the presentation today. So thank you so much. Um, I believe that uh, the team are going to be uh, adding some more resources into the chat as well, uh, which will go to one of the questions that we had about wanting to find out more. So they'll be there um, for you to follow some links. Um, and just a reminder to everyone that we will be having these events uh, tomorrow and Friday. So tomorrow at uh, 2 p.m. we are with Mia, who will be taking us through a day in the life of your dog. And 
um, just to let you know, we're going to have some actual dogs. So I am super excited. Um, and then on Friday, uh, Sonia will be with us and she'll be telling us why different foods taste wonderfully together. And there might be some hot dogs and sandwiches, but I can't guarantee. All right. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much again, Matt. Um, have a lovely afternoon, everyone. Um, and we'll see you tomorrow at 2 p.m.